we'll get straight on. Um, so I'm going to give a talk on the ABCDE assessment. Um, it's something that we talk about a lot and we mention quite a lot. So this is just a kind of simple overview of what we mean when we say that assessment, just to kind of get you thinking about the kind of things that we would examine for and ask for in each of the sections. And then we'll go through some case studies at the end about getting you to think through what you would do for that uh, individual patient. So, you know, it's a simple method. Um, you can apply it um, to all sorts of situations. It will serve you well when you're on call and being asked to see patients all around the hospital to quickly be able to assess and triage them. Um, if, you, if you go completely mind blank at the end of an OSCE, it's a safe one to kind of fall back on because um, you're going to cover all your bases with it and show that you're safe. Um, and the key things to kind of remember is that the idea of it is that you're trying to correct <coughs> the problems at each part before moving on to the next. Because problems with the airway are going to kill you before problems with the lungs. Problems with the lungs are going to kill you before problems with your circulation. You know, it's a bit of a theoretical framework because actually when you've got a patient in front of you, you're going to be assessing lots of things at the same time. Lots of observations and things are going to be shouted to you at all at the same time. But it's a general framework for you to, to assess patients by. Um, never forgetting to call for help early if you need it. Um, Basically, the main thing about finals is to prove that you'll be safe doctors so that you won't get marked down for saying that you would ask for a senior review or you'd call your registrar or consultant, etc. Because effectively, you just want to show that you would be a safe F1 on the job. So, as I'm sure you know later, what all the categories stand for, and we'll just go through them all um, now. So, airway how do we assess someone's airway? You talk to them, really simple. So if they talk back to you, um, you know, whatever language, if they're being able to talk to you, um, their airway is clear. In a child, if they're screaming to the top of their, their, their lungs allow and making nice vocal noises, then again, you can kind of infer that their airway is clear. What are some signs that maybe an airway isn't clear? Yeah, kind of added noisy sounds, snoring, gurgling sounds. And, and what might you do if you detect those sounds? Yeah, head tilt, chin lift. And um, what's another thing you can do? Jaw thrust. Yeah, good. Um, other things you might do if you're hearing lots of noises? Yeah, suction. So have a look in the mouth. Is there vomit there? Have they coughed up some blood or etc. that's all, all there? And can you, can you suction it out safely? So good added sounds. Um, if there's visible obstruction, can you remove them safely? Safety being the key there, only suction where you can see. You don't want to just shove down the, the young kasaka and you know, stimulate their gag reflex and make them vomit and make the situation work worse. So always just suction where you can see. And can you implement any treatment? And we've already mentioned some of the things that we can do. So simple airway maneuvers, the head tilt, chin lift, or the jaw thrust. So generally we say about the jaw thrust if we're worried about spinal injury, but it's actually quite a use, useful, simple thing to do, especially if you're going to be holding um, airway masks and stuff on as well. It's generally the jaw thrust that is yeah, easier to do. Um, if you've done that and that's helped the airway, or perhaps you've done that and it hasn't really helped the airway, what other things can we think about doing? Yep, yeah, yeah, airway adjuncts. So what are some adjuncts that we know? Giddell airway, good, also known as a oropharyngeal airway. How do we measure for a Giddell airway? Yeah, so for oropharyngeal airway, it's a hard to hard. So it's from the incisors to the angle of the jaw. The other one? Nasopharyngeal airway. How do we measure for a nasopharyngeal airway? So it's soft to soft, so it's from the, the nostril to the earlobe. Good. We're remembering that we wouldn't want to put in a nasopharyngeal airway if we're, we're worried about trauma, basal skull fractures, because um, obviously you could poke through into the brain, which would be bad. Um, and then other ones that you'll, you'll see are the laryngeal mask airway, um, intubation or a crocothyroidotomy, uh, if the anaesthetist there or you're feeling very, very brave. Um, <laughs> The laryngeal mask airway was actually invented by an anaesthetist from Newham Hospital. So, local, local man. He got in trouble because, have you all seen a laryngeal mask airway? 
how it's mold, like modelled and masks and sits in the larynx. The cleaner reported him because he thought, uh, she thought he was uh, taking moulds of his uh, female patient's groins and keeping them in his office for his pleasure. Um, it was actually because he was trying to develop a life-saving airway device, but it was a short case, I think. Okay, so we're happy with the airway. We're moving on to breathing. What, how do we assess breathing? Respiratory rate, yeah. Really, what's normal respiratory rate in an adult? Yeah, 12 to 16, 12 to 20, um, depending on who you ask. Other things about breathing? So saturation is really good. What are we aiming for the most part? Above, yeah, above 94 generally we say. Um, other things about breathing? Work of breathing. So are they sitting there comfortably? Are they really technic, using all of their accessory muscles? Their shoulders are going, the na the na their nostrils are flaring, um, they're taking huge deep breaths, they, they look like they're struggling. So what's the work of breathing? What else are you going to do? Listen to the chest. And what sort of things are we listening for? Crepitations. Bronchial breathing, air entry. Is there wheeze? Um, is, there, you know, is there actually air entry? Is there any evidence of a, a pneumothorax there? Don't get distracted by wheeze. The, the, the kind of severity of the wheeze is not the best marker for the um, kind of the difficulty they are having in breathing. Because if you've got really narrow uh, uh, airways, you might not actually generate much wheeze. Um, so the severity of wheeze is not the best marker, but obviously if there's wheeze there, then there are things that we can, we can do. Um, and just a general kind of quick respiratory exam, so assessing um, uh, percussion notes and things, assessing for uh, pneumothoraces. So how are they breathing? What's the respiratory rate? Um, this is an important one to remember. If the patient's not breathing, then that's a cardiac arrest. So begin CPR. You, you will see it all the time when you do sim sessions that the, patient, the, the person will be assessing for breathing and say, okay, there's not breathing. Um, right, okay, so circulation. Um, no, 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 no. If they're not breathing, you need to breathe for them, and that's a cardiac arrest. Don't get distracted. You know, know when to stop on the, these algorithms. Um, simple things like that. So... Obviously, you'll be thinking about potential uh, investigations that you can bring in at this stage. So common ones, for obviously, for breathing would be a chest X-ray, um, peak expiratory uh, flow rate. ABG is a, a really, really useful one to be doing here. Um, if you're in resus, if you're in a critically ill situation, then you, know, you can ask for the radiographer to bring the portable X-ray and get that going while you're still doing your assessment. Um, and doing the ABG here, it's where things kind of overlap because actually if you're doing an ABG, why don't you take off enough blood to do all of your blood tests and things there? So kind of thinking ahead about stuff that you might want. Cool. And can you implement any treatments? So what kind of things would you do in breathing? What are simple treatments that we can give? So if they're hypoxic, we're going to give oxygen. If they're wheezy, nebulizers, salbutamol, uh, ibuprofen, very good. So circulation, how do we assess circulation? So heart rate, good. Blood pressure, really, really important. Cap refill, how do you assess cap refill properly? Yeah, so you can do it peripherally or essentially. If someone's shut down in that, then centrally <coughs> is better. So just pushing on the sternum. Make sure you push for five seconds, get that blood out of the, those capillaries, and then assess and count properly, proper seconds to see how long it takes to come back. Good. Uh, so we said about heart rate, blood pressure. What's the important thing to remember about blood pressure in generally healthy people in a shock situation? It, we, yeah, people can cons uh, compensate really well. So the blood pressure is often the last thing to fall. The first thing to go up is often the respiratory rate and pulse. The blood pressure is the last sign to fall. So if the blood pressure is falling, then you need to be worried because they're reaching the end of their reserve. Other things that come under circulation? JVP, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it being assessed in the acute situation, but it, it is an important sign to 
Remember? Have a listen to the heart like we did with the lungs. Is there a murmur? You know, if it's a new patient, you might not know if they've had a murmur previously, but if they've been on the ward for ages and a murmur's not been heard before and it's a, a suddenly appeared, then that you know, might be a hint that something's gone on in the heart. Um, urine output, we don't often think about in circulation, but obviously the, the kidneys need um, circulation to perfuse. What's their um, urine output been over the last few hours? If they've just come into hospital, it might be difficult to know. If they've been in hospital, have they got a catheter in? Can you actually assess? 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. Effectively, it's half the weight uh, per hour is what you're, you're, you're hoping for. So, you know, in a 100 kilo person, you'd expect them to pass 50 mils an hour. So it's a, a kind of quicker, easy way of thinking about how much you'd expect from them. JVP, auscultate the heart. So this would be a good opportunity to gain some IV access. Again, taking off your bloods if you're putting the cannula in. Um, you might want an ECG if they're tachycardic or have any arrhythmias, if it's irregular, etc. You might be thinking about further investigation. So if you've, you've heard a murmur here, then you'll be thinking about arranging an echo once you've stabilised the patient. Good. Disability. What kind of things come under disability? So, yeah, assessment of the pupils. GCS, glucose, good. And one more I've got. Temperature, good. So what's the conscious level? So if, you, if you're really worried and you haven't got full time to do a full GCS or it, your mind goes blank and you can't remember it, then the AVPU score can be useful. So are the, is the patient alert and responsive? Are they responding to you when you, you shout at them? Are they only responding when you're, you're stimulating pain? Or are they completely unresponsive? The GCS, um, everyone forgets it, don't worry. Just kind of think through each sip, you know, section um, by itself and, and, and try and make a judgment call on it. Let's go through some examples. So what's this gentleman's GCS? Anyone? 10 or 11, 8, 9. How many for 8, 9, 10, 11? Kind of normal distribution around the right answer there. So that's 9. So his eyes are opening to pain. So he gets 2 for pain. Um, he's muttering noises. So, you know, mutters. So that's incomprehensible sounds. Um, and on pressure to his trapezius, his height, right hand reaches up, so that's trying to localise to the pain. Um, so five, so nine for him. So an 85-year-old woman on the medical ward, she's sitting in bed reading. Uh, she puts it down when you ask, uh, but she thinks you're her grandchild. <coughs> 14, any disagreement there? No, that's, I'd say that's right. So she's sitting reading the paper, so her eyes are open spontaneously. Um, she thinks you're someone you're not, so we could say that she's confused, so she drops a point there. Um, but you ask her to put down the paper so you can assess, and she does that. She follows your commands, so she's obeying commands for motor. So, 14. So a seven-year-old girl is unresponsive to pain and shows no movement uh, despite painful stimuli. Three, yeah, good, just to... Uh, emphasize the point that obviously the minimum score you can get is three. Last one. I got 12 for the dog. So obeying commands, probably making incomprehensible sounds um, <laughs> and eyes opening spontaneously. The point there is GCS is not the perfect score. You know, if someone's got a background of being uh, blind or deaf and that you don't know that, then they might not respond as you'd expect. Um, if they've got lots of, um, you know, a neuromuscular disorder, they might not be able to respond to pain, etc. So it's not a perfect system, but it is useful, um, uh, a useful general assessment. And it's useful for that individual patient, pa individual patient if you're reassessing and if that GCS is changing for that individual patient then that's obviously a very uh, valid thing to be aware of. So equal and reactive pupils is there any evidence of an, in, uh, an acute intracranial uh, event? 
blood glucose some people say abc don't ever forget glucose it is often forgetting forgotten it'll obviously be done on it will be a value on your your abg vbg if you if you do one uh, but if not then make sure we do a capillary um, blood glucose so say someone's blood glucose is two what kind of things would we think about doing yeah absolutely so it depends on what their level of consciousness is so if they're alert and speaking to you and they can take a big gulp of leucoside or you can put some um, glucogel under the, the tongue and that be absorbed orally then that that would be useful if they're unconscious then what do we need to do so yeah there's a couple of options so one is iron glucagon to stimulate gluconeogenesis in the liver in what what situation wouldn't we use iron glucagon so in alcoholics because the problem with hyperglycemia and alcohol is a, it was a, uh, a failure of gluconeogenesis, so there's no point stimulating it because it's not going to occur. Um, so what other options do, can, do we have? IV glucose. IV glucose, so a bolus of 10, 20% dextrose. Just try and avoid 50% dextrose if we can because it's quite irritant to veins, but if that's the only thing that's going to work, um, then we need to give it. Obviously then rechecking the glucose, people can get a rebound hyperglycemia even if you've resolved it. Someone that keeps rebounding hyperglycemia you need to, might need to start them on a, a dextrose infusion until they're out of their acute illness. Um, and temperature that we've said. So remembering that hypothermia is as important as hyperthermia. Hypothermia in itself can be a marker of sepsis. Um, and often, you know, you get people coming in that are acutely unwell who are, who are very cold. They may have been stuck in bed, not been able to turn the heating on. And, you know, it has really high mortality. If someone is really cold, then you need to think about warming them up with blankets, bear huggers, um, warm IV fluids, etc., etc., to get that temperature up. Exposure is basically everything else. So a full assessment of that patient, assessing for any rashes, things outside of the patient, so any collateral history, looking at the drug chart. Whenever you're in hospital, always have a look at the drug chart. It's where most answers can be found. Um, have they been taking any drugs? Have they been given a drug? Have they not been taking a drug they would usually take? And that's the, the um, cause of their change in status um, and taking a collateral if needed. And then the, you know, the, the important thing of reassessing. If you've done something, you need to go back and reassess to check that your intervention, has, or what effect your intervention has had. Okay, so we'll just quickly go through some examples. We've discussed a lot of the kind of things that we've been doing as we've gone, gone through. Um, so this 52-year-old uh, gentleman is brought in by ambulance with shortness of breath and cough. So what are we going to do? Say that. Uh, well, yeah, an a to ABCD assessment, as the lecture suggests. So we're going to talk to him. Yeah, he kind of talks back to you, um, says he doesn't feel very well, so we're happy with airway. Um, breathing, so he's technic, uh, saturating 85% with a 15 litres going through a Hudson mask, and there's some wheeze throughout the chest, and there's some crackles at the right base. So what are we going to do here? Give him, so we give him some nebulizers. What nebulizers are we going to give? What's the dose of salbutamol? Five milligrams. Um, anything else? Ipotropium. So you can put salbutamol and ipotropium in the same neb. What's the dose of ipotropium for an adult? 500 micrograms. Good. Um, what's the benefit of giving a nebulizer in this situation? So you can drive the nebulizer with oxygen, so you're still giving oxygen. It's looking like he's going to be needing more oxygen, so another thing, you can put nasal cannula on at the same time um, to give a little bit more. If we've given the nebulizer and we're going to put him back on um, the 15 litres, are we happy with this mask? What's a Hudson mask? It's what, so the Hudson mask is just the, the normal one that you get here, there and everywhere. What mask does this gentleman need? A non-rebreathe there. So he's not you're not happy with those saturations despite 15 litres, but a lot of that 15 litres will just be going out the sides of that mask. You need a non-rebreathed mask. Um, and if that's still failing, then you're going to be, you know, getting the anaesthetist involved. Maybe this person needs uh, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, with the coarse crackles, what are we going to be thinking about here? So we're thinking of infection. It's localised crepitations. So we are thinking about doing... 
Surface of six, getting a chest X-ray. Yep. Um, anyone else? Anyone do an ABG now? I think that'd be reasonable. You've got a 50-year-old saturating really poorly, despite oxygen. So you want to know: Is this guy in type one respiratory failure? They're in type two respiratory failure, um, and it gives you a quick snapshot of things as well. Okay, so we've got him on his nebulizer and high flow oxygen. Um, we carry on our assessment. So he's a little tachycardic, blood pressure's holding out, cap refill is normal. Happy? I'm generally quite happy with them. They're not too, too bad, but it would be a good point to get in a cannula. We've already thought that he, he's got an infection. We're going to start the sepsis 6, so he's going to need uh, a cannula. What kind of cannula would we choose? A nice big one, um, pink or green minimum. So he's febrile, his glucose is okay, and he's alert. So what does this confirm for us? So he's septic. So we can say he's septic now, can't we? So he's got a temperature, he's tachycardic, we've got a, a likely source of an infection, um, so we're going to be wanting to instigate the sepsis 6. Um, and his GP was already on to the fact that he might have an infection, but obviously the amoxicillin isn't working. So what antibiotics might we want to start for this, this gentleman? So chlorithromycin would be a, a, a yeah, reasonable thing to add in. I, I would imagine this guy would also get a kermoxiclab. Would, I imagine kermoxiclab and chlorithromycin would be, would be a reasonable combination for this person. As always, get help. This man is desaturating despite lots of oxygen, so immediately you should be thinking, I might be out of my depth here. Um, going to give oxygen, we're going to give some medication to try and uh, avert that wheeze. Um, we want to upgrade the mask, <coughs> ABGs and chest x-rays, we've said, cannabis bloods, and then the sepsis slick, so fluids, antibiotics, um, lactate, etc. Good. And reassess. So you're called to see a 63-year-old lady on the surgical ward who has become unresponsive. What do we assess? So airway, and you hear lots of gurgling and snoring noises. So, so roller on her side, try and open up that airway. Um, get the suction, have a look, is there anything there? So there's nothing there, but actually just doing a simple airway manoeuvre resolves those, those snoring noises. So you're going to call for help, you know, you're going to be busy dealing with that airway, so you definitely need some more help here. Pull the emergency alarm at the end of the bed, and never be afraid to pull that emergency alarm. You won't get told off for pulling it, but you might get pulled off for not pulling it. Um, so you do, you're doing some assessment, so respiratory rate is 7 um, and she's only saturating 88% on air. Yeah, someone has a quick listen, but there's just lots of transmitted sounds. There's just lots of upper airway noises. Nothing necessarily wrong with the lungs. So what are we going to do now? Going to put on some oxygen. What, what kind of things might be going on here with that respiratory rate? Yeah, uh, potentially an opioid overuse here. Is it on a surgical ward, post-op, taking a bit too much for PCA, a bit too much oromorph, um, and has got some opioid toxicity. Um, it's a bit tachycardic, can't get a blood pressure, everyone's faffing around too much. We're happy with those. So she's borderline cold, GCS. Not good, so you know anything less than eight, we can say someone's in a coma effectively and it's not safe to maintain their own airways. And small pupils, does that go with our differential? Yeah. Absolutely. So goes off to find the drug chart. What would be the def definitive treatment in someone with naloxone? Good. What's the important thing to remember about naloxone? Short half-life, so don't go off for your break. Make sure you're there to reassess and give it again if needed. So you're walking down the street and see a man collapse. Ask him if he's all right. He doesn't respond, but there's no obvious obstruction. Can't detect any respiration. CPR, CPR good, you remember. Call for help, commence CPR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think this is the last one. So you're called to see an 83-year-old lady on the care of the elderly ward. 
She had been admitted with a UTI, um, and she's developed some difficulty in breathing. Um, so she's talking to you, and the airway's patent. Breathing, so she's a bit technic. Again, she's desaturating on air, um, and this lady has some fine crepitations at the bases. So again, usual things that we've been thinking about. So I'm going to put some oxygen on this, on this lady. Be reasonable to start thinking about getting a chest X-ray, calling up the mobile X-ray if you're if you're worried. Um, what do we think about that? So yeah, so she's got a, an irregular pulse. Um, it's fast. We need to get an ECG. We need to know what the underlying rhythm is here, um, and it might be contributing to her symptoms. That we're generally happy with. General assessment, she's got some edema. Um, IV fluids are running. What might we want to do? It's reasonable to stop the food. You know, she's got fine crepitations. That could be pulmonary edema. Um, she's an old lady. She's got an irregular heart rate. Might be AF. She might be kind of an acute heart failure. Um, everything causes AF. Literally anything you can think of probably uh, can cause AF. Um, you know, so this lady has numerous causes of that. She might not have had it before. It might be a new thing. Um, you don't want to overload that heart. Um, good. So you think about doing chest X-ray, getting the oxygen on. ABG is reasonable. It's probably wouldn't, I wouldn't probably jump at it in, in this situation immediately because um, there's lots of other things going on, and the, the primary problem might not actually be in the lungs. It's probably the heart in this situation. So you want to stop those fluids. Um, Recap the patient's history. It would be reasonable if you're thinking of fluid overload to give furosemide. If you're worried about giving furosemide, then GTN infusion is something else you can do if they've got terrible renal function. Um, but you'll be wanting to discuss with the med reg, discuss with cardio. If, you know, if this is an acute onset AF, do we need to cardio that, give some metoprolol, et cetera, et cetera, um, and sort this lady out. Good. So it's a simple, safe approach to use. Correct abnormalities as you go on. And it's really simple interventions can save lives in, the, in these situations. Uh, and the you know, big things to remember is always reassess and, and ask for help early on to show that you're safe. Any questions on that? <laughs>